Today we're going to talk about peanut butter. Peanut butter was a staple food group for me growing up. I would spread it on a morning English muffin, eat a PB&J for lunch at school, and if everything went according to plan, end the day with a peanut butter cup or two, or three or four. That's called bookending, by the way, when you start and end your day with the same food. And the greatest way to bookend your day is eating a leftover slice of pie for breakfast and then another for dessert that night. But we aren't here to talk about pie. Now, I'm far from alone in my peanut butter childhood. Every classroom I spent time in before the age of 10 smelled like peanut butter and brown paper bags. At the time, I never questioned peanut butter's ubiquity, but it's pretty unique and uniquely American. Enslaved Africans brought peanuts to North America in the 1700s. It wasn't until about the 1800s that they became a commercial crop. To talk about peanuts in America is to talk about George Washington Carver. Born into slavery, he ended up being the first African American to earn a Bachelor of Science degree. He then went on to earn a Master of Agriculture degree and spent the rest of his career running the agriculture school at the Tuskegee Institute. He had a brilliant mind for agriculture and his plant obsession focused on what we would now call sustainable farming practices. In 1908, he published How to Grow the Peanut and 105 Ways of Preparing It for Human Consumption, which is such a great title. Interestingly, peanut butter wasn't one of the 105, but without his work on the farming of peanuts as a means to help poor Southern farmers, peanut butter would likely have never gotten off the ground in the first place. Since its debut, peanut butter has gone on a pretty wild ride in this country, from sanitarium food to rations and sustenance through two world wars and the Great Depression and into billions of lunch boxes. And in 2022, we've got three categories of peanut butter at the supermarket. Let's take a look. Now the first category are peanut butters made with hydrogenated oil and sugar. This group includes the classic versions from familiar brands such as Skippy, Jif, and Peter Pan. The naturally occurring oil in peanuts and peanut butter is liquid at room temperature because it is composed of mostly unsaturated fatty acids. Partial hydrogenation is a process that converts it to a fat that is solid or semi-solid at room temp. This process was applied to peanut butter in the early 1920s to solve the problems of oil separation and rancidity. That made peanut butter far more shelf-stable and had a huge impact on its availability and popularity. So did sliced bread, which was first produced on July 6, 1928. Isn't that crazy? Just 1928? So when we say the best thing since sliced bread, we're essentially saying the best thing since the summer of 1928. I'm gonna start saying that. With shelf-stable peanut butter and sliced bread at hand, a sandwich was always just seconds away. Okay, back to the other categories. Next are peanut butters that swap hydrogenated oils for palm oil and are often labeled natural. Palm oil is a highly saturated fat that is naturally solid at room temperature, so it fills the role of that partial hydrogenation. This category includes natural versions of Skippy, Jif, and Peter Pan. The final category is peanut butters made with just peanuts and salt with no added oils or sugar. Pretty novel idea. There are loads of these peanut butters on the market now, and they will all be labeled natural. Now, of course, these peanut butters suffer from the same issue of separation that peanut butters before 1920 did. One of the best ways to combine the oil and nut solids is this tool. Now, this thing doesn't do anything else other than this job, but it does the job pretty well. Something to consider if you are a natural peanut butter person. Beyond those three categories, we gotta talk about the big debate. I'm talking creamy versus crunchy. Or is it smooth versus chunky? Eh, I'm not sure about that. That's not the debate though. Let me know in the comments if you like smooth slash creamy or chunky slash crunchy. I really hope it stays civil down there. If you are a crunchy person, have you ever wondered how many crunchy peanut pieces are in a jar versus other brands? Well, some of my friends on the ATK reviews team did, and so they counted them. For each crunchy peanut butter brand, they weighed the contents of the jar and then placed the peanut butter in a colander. They used hot water to rinse away all of the butter until only the crunchy peanut pieces remained. They then let the pieces dry, weighed them, and used that measurement to calculate what percentage of each product was actually peanut pieces. They tested all of the big supermarket peanut butter brands and found that they ranged from 11 to 24% peanut pieces. That's right, a quarter of your jar could be unbuttered peanuts. Some times we live in, man. If you want your crunch to be on the high end, look for extra crunchy or super chunk on the labels. Okay, that is more than enough about store-bought peanut butter. Let's go to the kitchen and check out how easy it is to make it ourselves. You can start with raw or roasted peanuts, but make sure they are unsalted. We'll do all of the seasoning ourselves so we have full control over it. The first step is to roast them in a 375 degree oven until fragrant and slightly darkened. 
This step is all about adding lovely roasted flavor. Once the peanuts are cooled down a bit, we'll process them until the oil is released and a paste begins to form. They'll transition from coarsely chopped to finely chopped to a dense paste until finally, we've released enough oil for it all to turn to peanut butter. Then we scrape down and add honey and salt. These are obviously optional ingredients, but I really like peanut butter with a hint of sweetness and enough salt to make all of the flavor pop. Then we'll process a few minutes longer. Now let's check out the consistency. Do you like it? Too thin, too thick? Well, we've got ways to adjust it in both directions. If your peanut butter is too thick for your liking, add oil one teaspoon at a time to thin it out. But if it's too thin, add water one teaspoon at a time to thicken it up. Water to thicken? Are you serious, Dan? Look, you don't have to believe me on this. Just check out this experiment. I've split this one batch of homemade peanut butter into two samples. To one, I'm gonna add two teaspoons of oil, which thins it right out. And to the other, I'm gonna stir in one teaspoon of water. Look at what a massive difference that water made. Pretty amazing, right? You wanna know why that happened? You do? How badly do you wanna know? I'm just kidding. I was gonna tell you anyway. Nut butters are emulsions, which means they consist of droplets of one liquid, in this case water, dispersed in another liquid, in this case oil. Adding more of the dispersed liquid creates more droplets, which then bump into each other when the emulsion is stirred or poured, making it thicker. This is also one of the reasons why when you put a spoonful of peanut butter in your mouth, it gets increasingly thicker, clingier, and harder to swallow as it absorbs water from your mouth. Well, now we've got peanut butter, and that means it's PB&J time. As a kid, my favorite version was white bread, peanut butter, and grape jelly. And it's still a great sandwich. But nowadays, I'm so sophisticated, so I go with raspberry jam. Now in my mind, there are two kinds of PB&Js. The kind you're gonna eat right after you cut it in half, and the kind you make to take with you. If it's a to-go PB&J, I spread peanut butter on both sides of the bread. That helps waterproof the bread so the J doesn't sog it out. If I'm gonna eat it immediately, I spread PB on just one side. I have such fond memories of eating PB&Js at the beach that I actually don't mind slash kind of like a tiny, tiny bit of sand in there. Not like on purpose, but if it happens, you know? Was that an overshare? It was, huh? Yeah, okay. So this has absolutely nothing to do with peanut butter, but can we just pause for a minute and talk about how great boiled peanuts are? Cooked in heavily salted water for hours, they're salty, creamy, rich, and absolutely delicious. If beer has a better friend than boiled peanuts, I haven't met them yet. And beer introduced me to all of its friends. Okay, we can get back to peanut butter now. First up, Cook's Illustrated Deputy Food Editor Andrew Geary's recipe for peanut butter sandwich cookies. You can take my word for it or listen to the data. This is one of the most popular recipes the Cook's Illustrated team has created in over 25 years. For these cookies, the name of the whole game is peanut butter to the max. For the cookies, we start by pulsing peanuts until finely chopped. Adding these peanuts to the dough makes it less likely to spread in the oven, which means we can cut back on flavor dulling flour. The rest of the dough comes together in a snap. We've got flour, baking soda, and salt in one bowl. How do you say, uh, dry ingredients? and butter, peanut butter, sugar, brown sugar, milk, and egg in the second bowl. That's what I personally like to call the wet ingredients. Then we just mix, add chopped peanuts, portion, and bake. The filling is even easier. We have our friends peanut butter and butter. You know, should we change the name of butter to not peanut butter? Or maybe no peanut butter? Or about peanut free butter? I need help with that one. Let me know what you think in the comments. To the peanut butter and no peanut butter, we add confectioner's sugar and stir them together in a way too small bowl. Sometimes I just like the challenge, that too small of a bowl challenge. Now we just fill, press, and bite into peanut butter nirvana. Seriously, these are so good. Now I know I'm probably biased, but if you ask me, these cookies are the best thing since the summer of 1928. Finally, we gotta talk about peanut butter cups. Chocolate and peanut butter is pretty unbeatable, and the cup is an iconic combo. But store-bought isn't the only way to go. I'm gonna show you a recipe that is from ATK Kids. Did you know that America's Test Kitchen has an entire team dedicated to making amazing recipes for future chefs of all ages? Well, it's true. And they have a YouTube channel. There's a link below to check it out. This recipe is really fun to make with a group, but for some reason I'm doing it all by myself. We'll squeeze some melted milk chocolate into the bottoms of mini muffin tins lined with paper liners. Then we knock the pan against the counter to make it nice and flat. After a quick stint in the freezer to firm up, we add our peanut butter layer. You might recognize this mixture. It's creamy peanut butter, confectioner sugar, no peanut butter, and salt. We'll pipe that layer in, briefly freeze, and then finish with a second layer of chocolate. All right, now here's my favorite part of the recipe. I take it out of the paper and pop it in my mouth. Mm, mm, mm. 
Whether you're taking it straight out of the jar with a spoon, making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, sandwiching it between peanut butter cookies, or sandwiching it between chocolate, I guess it's all sandwiches. Ah, whatever. This is how to eat peanut butter. Thank you so much for watching. Now, if you want to learn more about George Washington Carver, there are a few links below this video, including a link to his 105 ways of preparing peanuts. Some fine ideas in there. Of course, there are also links to Cook's Illustrated, so you can grab today's recipes. You gotta make those sandwich cookies. Now hop in the comments and let me know your peanut butter preference. Hydrogenated, palm oil, all natural. And what about creamy versus crunchy? Smooth versus chunky? Let me know.